Okay, we'll start off week eight talking about potassium. We've thinking about where we've been with the course already. We've talked about soil acidity, of course, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus, and now on to potassium. Okay, so we're progressing through. Uh, potassium is um, often the second or third most frequently deficient nutrient. It really just depends. A lot of times it's uh, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but really depends on the soil and the system that you're in. Um, potassium is absorbed in large amounts into the plant after nitrogen. The content ranges anywhere between 1 to 5 percent, um, typically somewhere around 2 percent in biomass. Um, we think a lot about potassium with uh, hay crops or silage crops because there's a lot of potassium that's in that biomass and ultimately gets removed relative to uh, other types of you know horticultural systems or even grain cropping systems. Just as an overview, you know, kind of very broadly, potassium is often associated with stronger stalks and stems, uh, which reduces this idea of like lodging. Uh, this is really in field crops we're talking. Um, lodging being uh, wind or heavy rain blowing plants over and laying down, and so. Um, and we also think about uh, potassium being related to kind of plant immunity and um, a deficiency in potassium increasing um, crop disease stress. So again, here we are, potassium. Uh, the form taken up is primarily this elemental K, so it's this ionic form of K. You know, that compare that to, say, nitrogen or phosphorus, which um, it wasn't... Um, you know, there's other atoms in there, of course. The major source here is soil minerals. Again, we can compare this to the other nutrients that we've seen to date and this average concentration, okay? So primarily taking up is, is K+, plus, uh, and the primary source is from the soil itself, mineralogy. Soil potassium exists really in four forms, and like lots of things we've talked about, uh, for phosphorus, um, potassium, a lot, number of things, you know, uh, there's a, we might say that, that they can exist in these different forms, and these forms are often operationally defined, meaning that they are defined by the, our methods of extracting and quantifying them. Okay, so in this regard, we talk about K in four separate forms: the mineral form, the non-exchangeable, the exchangeable, and then the solution form. Okay. Um, and so this would go from uh, from mineral being the least available to solution being readily available plant. So it, it's moving uh, downward in this list through as it decreases it gets more available to the plant. Mineral K makes up the vast vast majority of soil K. Most of the potassium in that soil is in this mineral fraction. It's really unavailable, um, not exchangeable maybe one to three percent and then this readily available which we could just lump and people often do this exchange but what, that is what's on that that cation complex and then what's in the solution is very very small percentage um, soils in Ohio um, recently glaciated soils relatively recently glaciated can have up to thirty thousand pounds of K uh, per acre in the plow layer so a tremendous amount of potassium but again the you know, similar to this paradox of nitrogen in the atmosphere, we almost have a paradox of potassium in the soil, but it just isn't available. It's in a form that plants can't get at. So that's that's the issue. Thinking a little bit more about the form that potassium plays in plants, um, it's again it's absorbed as this uh, ionic K. Uh, potassium is um, unique in the sense that it really doesn't get incorporated into kind of biochemical compounds very often. The vast majority of it, it exists as kind of this mobile nutrient. So it uh, is taken up as K as an ion and it remains in an ion and it's you know a lot of the function that it serves is um, relating to ionic strength and solution itself. So you know this is also true in humans, right? We talk about our potassium and our chloride levels and say like in our kind of our, our biophysiology the same is often uh, thought of in plants as well um, but of course it, it 
it functions in a number of capacities like these main macronutrients that exist in, in many forms they serve in many different functions in the plant not just one unique little function here or there so potassium is important for many crop quality characteristics okay so synthesis and transport of photosynthates um, conversion into carbohydrates um, proteins oils and other products so Again, this idea of, of plant metabolism, and we'll just go into this a teeny bit more. So this is just a sh graph showing um, potassium concentration in tissue versus CO2 assimilation. So this is a, a measurement of photosynthesis, okay? And so K okay, is essential for, you know, good photosynthetic function. Um, it provides roles in ATP synthesis in the production of this uh, rubisco which is often considered you know the most abundant enzyme and the most abundant protein on the planet because it's this is the you know the site of photosynthesis right and so um, co2 is absorbed to the leaf stomates and and then potassium regulates some of that uh, stomatal conductance and then this idea of um, the maintenance of electroneutrality through uh, the phosphorylation and chloroplast. So suffice it to say potassium plays multiple roles in photosynthesis and it's really important uh, in that function you know similar to nitrogen and if, if we're plants lacking potass uh, potassium then its ability to photosynthesize efficiently is going to be compromised. Um, other functions we've already just touched on a teeny bit, so important for energy utilization, starch synthesis, nitrogen metabolism, respiration. Translocation of assimilates, uh, photosynthate is transported from leaves to fruits where they are stored and used for later growth, okay? So this idea of it being kind of a, a shuttle or a mechanism helping move when plants uh, you know, fix carbon, and what is is that an intermediary form in terms of that reduced carbon? Uh, where does it go? How's it stored? Potassium plays a role in that. And the, and you know, in the case of something, I mean, in the case of most agri agricultural crops of significance, there's this typically a period of production and storage, and then there's a period of fruit development or tuber development or you know seed development, and then there's a translocation. Uh, from the storage vessel to the harvested harvested unit vessel that we <laughs> are interested in, and so potassium plays a role in that. And then, of course, this you know idea of this um, osmotic pool um, that can do lots of things. This idea of you know managing water and water relations in terms of uh, its movement through plant tissue. And just to give you, you know, a little bit, um, potassium uh, increases water use, use efficiency and the ability of a plant to um, guard against drought stress. And so, you know, again, these guard cells it's, uh, are a way that the stom, you know, this is the mechanism that stomates open and close, of course, and. Uh, Potassium and, and binatrial chloride and then water will flood these guard cells and the stomates are closed in times of stress. And then when conditions return to good, they'll flow out, the stomates open, ox, uh, air can exchange and photosynthesis occurs. Okay, So, so again, it's uh, an important role for you know, many different functions in plants. Okay. Um, Here's a, you know just the kind of a little color pictorial of the the places potassium exists in soil, and here again these are our four pools that we talked about: this unavailable or mineral, very slowly available or um, not available, exchangeable, and then we've got this readily available that's essentially on that kind of exchange capacity on the soil colloid, and then what's actually in. Uh, diff um, in solution in that soil water, so in soil moisture, okay? So the primary uh, way that um, potassium is taken up by the plant, of course, is through the soil water, and then it's uh, that water, if I was drawing this figure, I'd have 
uh, you know, these colloids moving uh, via buffering capacity, moving into the soil water, then going into the plant. But the plant's able to take it up from, from both places. The primary mechanism to, of movement of K2 roots is through diffusion and mass flow, i.e. in this water, uh, soil moisture uh, maybe, maybe makes up roughly 10%. These are, of course, very rough figures and depends on the system and, and the environment, etc. So K deficiency is one of the... Uh, I don't know if it's the easiest, but it's a pretty, you see it quite readily uh, in the field, and it's um, it's a little bit distinct, so it's it's not particularly the hardest thing to detect, or it's a relatively simple to diagnose in many ways. Not Nothing's ever simple, I suppose, but um, at least it will tip you off. So, um, yellowing and necrosis on the edge of older leaves, that's really a, kind of a class book or textbook um, symptom of potassium deficiency. Later in the season, um, if there's a lot of lodging, stalks being thin and weak, um, and plants falling over, you know, that could be suspected potassium deficiency. There's been a lot, a lot of, you know, um, particularly in field crops, a lot of breeding efforts to make plants more resist, resilient. And, uh, Compared to modern day, you know, particularly corn, corn such a tall plant and um, and has a lot of potential for lodging. Uh, Twenty years ago, there was a lot more lodging. I mean, you talk to to farmers or to extension agents, people that have been in the industry for a long time. Um, a lot more lodging that occurred, say, 20, 30 years ago than it, than it does now, and that's primarily uh, through breeding and genetics, um, potassium nutrition probably plays a role in that as well. Okay, So again, uh, you know, thinking of our, our corn, um, this is a pretty classic uh, scenario where we've got a, a field here that hasn't received potassium fertilization. This is actually in Ohio for a long time. And you can see this kind of firing or yellowing on the leaf edges, particularly these lower leaves. So, again, it's a an immobile nutrient plant, just like nitrogen uh, and phosphorus. So, deficiencies are typically going to occur in the lower leaves first. And unlike nitrogen, which was a general yellowing or a firing down the midrib, potassium can occur. Uh, it's on the edges. So that's the the kind of the the big difference between those two. Um, you know, here's just uh, again from this uh, the International Plant Nutrition Institute um, discussion of what potassium does and what its deficiencies symptoms are. We already talked about all this, but I'll, I'll leave the text there for reference. Here's other examples of potassium deficiency in corn. It doesn't have to be a perfect, you know, yellowing around the edges. It can be more like legions. This almost looks a little bit more like uh, disease-like, but it's it's potassium deficiency. Again, that's environment and hybrid specific. Uh, potassium and soybeans in particular. Soybeans are very sensitive to, to, to potassium deficiency, and so we see these kind of patches of soybeans uh, commonly in Ohio. Things, uh, you know, looking in it. And you'll see that it's not all just lower leaves that occur here, but um, swaths. So something like this would be very, kind of very classic potassium deficiency and at any given summer if depending on how many fields you you visit uh, you know you'll see this from time to time it's not it's not particularly uncommon for that to happen okay not to say if you see a leaf and its uh, leaves are yellowing it's absolutely potassium deficiency it certainly could be foliar or some sort of insecticide burn there's a lot of a lot of reasons so but diagnosing things diagnosing these deficiencies this is kind of your first suspicion um, thinking about that. For wheat, again, some pictures and then maybe some other crops. Potatoes uh, and tomatoes, potassium, potatoes, tomatoes, potassium crops that we'd see here in, in Ohio, uh, very susceptible to potassium deficiency. Um, you know, things like tomatoes uh, require more potassium than they do nitrogen and so we're constantly thinking about potassium in, in tomatoes uh, versus nitrogen in terms of is the plant getting enough, et cetera, et cetera.
And it doesn't always have to be, uh, you know, a yellowing kind of burn. Sometimes it, it manifests again, these purpling. Um, this is an, a grape leaf, but, you know, this is some sort of stress response. Um, and likely this purple pigmentation is a result of anthocyanin production as a, as a stress response. So. Potassium uh, is very important for plant immunity and uh, interactions either. And it's interesting, there's literature is a bit mixed in terms of the positive and negative effects that either too little or too much potassium might have on disease uh, severity and disease, um, you know, uh, presence and severity. So here's just a little bit of data just showing that with potassium fertilization you get a reduced um, soybean disease load uh, in the pods and so um, just to you know understand that potassium does play a role in, in diseases of, of crops. So here's our glorious potassium cycle uh, as promised as we move through some of these cycles, they get a lot, you know, starting with nitrogen, which is a very complex cycle to phosphorus and potassium. It's uh, relatively, uh, at least conceptually, more simple in terms of the inputs, outputs, and the, and the transformations. And so, inputs are really potassium fertilizer, uh, residue, manure, biosolids, uh, things that are entering to the soil. Uh, losses would be primarily plant uptake and crop removal, a teeny bit of leaching that, that occurs, maybe more than a teeny bit, but you know, we don't think too much about that from kind of a mass balance perspective. Um, and then here we go, we have the primary minerals, um, feldspars, micas, others that weather into these non-exchangeable and then into the exchangeable K. And then again, we've got, um, this adsorption desorption processes off these exchange sites. Okay, so uh, these K fixation and release reactions can go both ways, um, and that's important. And we see that really um, not in perfectly consistent terms, but we see this over the course of a growing season or with a water soil interactions. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But anyways, here's your case cycle. Additions, losses, transformations. Okay. Um, I already mentioned that uh, K does not get incorporated into biochemical compounds in plants. And so it should come as no surprise that there's not very much potassium in soil organic matter since plant residue, plant material, roots and shoots essentially are the feedstock for soil organic matter, okay? Um, the, cal uh, the CC provides a lot of exchange sites for K, and K exists primarily in these exchange sites. Um, it doesn't mean to say that if we have organic matter, we're not gonna have any K associated with it, but from a, you know, relative to say nitrogen or phosphorus, um, there's a lot less K in organic matter than, than those two compounds, so. Um, Okay, so again, uh, here's another kind of pretty graphic showing um, availability of potassium depending on where it's at. And so these purple uh, circles indicate readily plant available, again, in that soil water and on the colloid. Slowly available are um, minerals that are trapped in, in between these colloids, okay, and then uh, unavailable are these kind of primary minerals, okay? So here's, you know, again, this idea of this gradient of availability of potassium depending on where, where it's at and how it exists in the soil. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this readily available. Um, we think of it as exchangeable, that is what's on the colloid and then what's in soil solution. It's typically a small percentage of the total soil K. Um, and potassium usually occupies, in general, one, three, maybe five, six percent at the most of total CEC. Okay, so the total exchange sites in the soil, small percentage, typically less than five percent, is uh, occupied by potassium. Okay, and then uh, again, this idea that K minerals um, 
buffer both solution and the exchange sites as potassium is lead and taken up um, it can get replenished depending on the buffering capacity of that soil by you know these maybe non-available or even mineral mineral um, pools. Solution K, uh, plants absorb K from the solution. Um, optimal plant growth ranges anywhere between 1 to 10 part per million in the soil, so that's what we'd like to see it out in an ideal world. Um, the quantity of K transported to the roof surface is re uh, related to intensity. That should be no surprise since it's a primarily diffusion-driven process. And of course, diffusion is always a slower process compared to mass flow, which is moving potassium in that soil water as it's flowing uh, toward the plant root, right? Um, exchangeable K is a, a measurement of K availability. This is really when we take a soil test potassium, this is what it's, it's intending to get after. It's, it's pulling potassium that's off that soil colloid, off those exchange sites and quantifying it. Okay, so the higher the CEC, of course, the more uh, potassium we're able to um, hold. Okay, so this idea that um, different binding positions of potassium. Potassium is again primarily supplied uh, through the mineral fraction and there's different places that it can exist and depending on where it exists uh, in that mineral fraction uh, will depend on how available it is. Okay, so um, the three really are, are planar, which um, are on the surface of these, these clay layers, the edge, which includes kind of on the outer edge, and then internally, which is our, um, our inside the layers of those clays. And so, not surprisingly, uh, you know, planar and edge are a lot more available than anything internally, okay? And so, what happens is, um, uh, K is released or it's fixed and through some of these these mineral interactions okay so non-exchangeable K can be um, is largely governed by this kind of weathering processes so uh, felts parts of micas you know uh, will weather into other secondary minerals and those minerals will be uh, more K available and uh, but some of these interactions, they can, depending on the environment and the soil, they can flow, you know, uh, back in terms of um, getting fixed or trapped in between these uh, soil layers. Okay, so um, water has a large, important role in this, and again, <clears throat> um, this this is a type of thing that can happen. You know, some of these pro weathering processes happen slowly over time, right, over decades or millennia even. But some of this happens <clears throat> and this entrapment can happen over just the course of a growing season depending on um, uh, moisture availability and what's happening with, the, you know, with the clay and, and the soil solution, the crop demand, etc. So, you know, there's just this idea that... Um, <clears throat> We can have micas or very dry soil, and these clay layers are, are really tightly held. Uh, when we introduce moisture content or moisture into the soil, these clay layers can expand, and then that, that giving a mechanism of release for the potassium. And then as these things weather, right, um, or develop, uh, we go from mica to hydrous mica to vermiculite, and you can see the K content up here from 10% all the way down to less than 1% as that potassium is interacting, is releasing from these clay layers and going into solution, okay? So water plays a very important role in terms of um, having those clay layers uh, essentially become exposed and then increasing that surface area. When we increase the surface area, we can see a greater exchange capacity and we're going again we can look at these CECs from mica to zero to 30 to 50 up, up to vermiculite which is um, you know rated at 150 here okay so you know we don't need to worry about getting the nitty-gritty of the mineralogy uh, for the purposes of this course you know there's other courses at OSU to, to, to get into that but you know suffice it to say that these are kind of mechanisms
this kind of K entrapment in layers, and then um, through weathering and through moisture interactions, uh, these layers can can open up and and make uh, potassium more available. So rates of weathering depend on um, the concentration of potassium in solution, the release. Not surprisingly, weathering occurs more rapidly in humid and warm environments, right? We think of a lot of soil weathering happening much faster in, say, tropical environments than, say, tundra environments. Freezing and thawing action often releases clays as well. So, you know, this idea of um, um, in our environment in Ohio with, with uh, frost and with freezing and thawing across the winter, we can get K release uh, with that as well. Um, <clears throat> clay type plays a really large role in K availability. Two to one clays, uh, not surprisingly, things like vermiculite, montmorillonite, micas often contain a lot more clays than, say, uh, one to one clays, things like uh, uh, can um, canola. Ah, I <laughs> Um, well, I'm not going to try to say it. I know that word, but it's it's just not coming to me right now. Okay, so anyways, we'll move on. Uh, soil moisture and drought, of course, that plays a, um, a role. And soil temperatures in terms of interacting with moisture and, and plant activity and uptake, okay? So uh, other factors, soil aeration. Um, plays a role in K availability and release, so things like uh, compaction or um, water saturation, oxygen supply, and the, the biology, of course, that comes with that. All these things um, play a role in how much available K will be in soil. pH as well plays a role, so this idea that um, you know, some clay is is governed by this kind of pH dependent charges on the exchange site. And so an example of that is when we sit, might lime or increase the pH of our soil, aluminum concentrations uh, drop because they're precipitated, and then that leaves more exchangeable sites for potassium. So just lowering, sorry, putting that pH in an optimal range will by default in essentially free up exchange sites for potassium, okay? So it's also important to know that um, when we lime the soil, calcium and magnesium also compete for K sites uh, on that CEC, on that colloid, and so when we lime the soil, we have a very real potential of knocking a lot of potassium off our exchange sites, okay? So soils that are limed very heavily, uh, we might think of inducing or this potential of inducing potassium deficiency with that. Um, in most soils, K leaching rates are small. Uh, it does happen, of course. Uh, we don't really think too much about it um, and certainly don't try to manage for it particularly. I, you know, I don't have, um, I haven't really seen data, say, in Ohio in terms of potassium leaching rates, but um, detectable but maybe not significant right so some of that depends on the soil texture naturally sandier soils are more prone to leaching the amount of water moving through that profile how much crop removal is there and how much is in the soil solution to begin with right so K leaching does occur and you know this is uh, our final slide here but I'll just wrap up by saying the potassium cycle is a bit you know, very different than the nitrogen and phosphorus that we talked about earlier. We don't really think, and maybe this is, <clears throat> we don't really think of potassium. We think of it more from kind of a primary and secondary mineral, oh, mineral uh, mineralogy piece and not particularly is a, is a pool that's fed by plants by a lot of microbial activity or coming a lot from my organic matter, okay? Not to say that Potassium isn't, you know, regulated or um, isn't important from a microbial perspective or a soil food web perspective, but it's just that um, uh, there's not that really intimate inter interaction that occurs, this immobilization and, and mineralization processes. So, so that's the case cycle. We'll uh, finish up potassium talking about potassium fertilizers in the next lecture.